to me. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode two of Talk Climate to Me, the online edition. This course is focused on women, and we mean that in the most inclusive sense of the word, because on the whole, women are more worried yet less confident talking about climate change. This course is designed to help. Once again, we've created a worksheet for those of you who like to take notes. The link to that is in the video description. All right, let's dive in. As always, I want to start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from near Orangeville, which are the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Piton, Huron-Wendat, Anishinaabe, and Mississauga peoples, including the Mississaugas of the Credit. We acknowledge that these lands are now home to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people from across Turtle Island. These lands are covered um, by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum, a peace agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy. This treaty committed their people to share resources across the Great Lakes region. The Dish With One Spoon Treaty has three general principles. First, take only what you need. Two, share or leave something for others. And finally, to keep the dish clean. These principles offer valuable lessons for the climate crisis. Like what would it look like if, you know, these principles were our climate policy? What if all our decisions had to satisfy these three rules? What might, what might society look like? If you'd like to learn more about the Dish With One Spoon uh, Treaty, we actually have a video link uh, to a video that features Rick Hill. He does an excellent job explaining the Dish With One Spoon, and um, I recommend you take a look at it. As we did last time, we're going to give ourselves just a moment to transition into this time together. Close your eyes if you'd like and let your attention turn inward. Let's take a deep breath in. And breath out. This episode is about empathy. And I invite you to take this time to feel empathy and kindness to yourself for all your gifts and for showing up every day. Now let's think of someone dear to you and let's send a little bit of love their way. And if you'd like, expand your awareness to all living beings, all people, animals, plants, waters. Think about all the ways we're all connected. You might think about the plants whose exhale creates air for us to breathe, or of the grandmothers who protect the lakes and rivers. Whoever or whatever you're thinking of, take a moment to remember them. Take one final breath. And when you're ready, open your eyes. All right. Now that we're settled, let's recap what we did last time. We listened in as Dr. Kim Nicholas gave Aliyah Kanani a primer on the climate crisis. Do you remember it? It's warming, it's us, we're sure, it's bad, and we can fix it. We were then magically transported to 2050 and learned how they kept the good stuff and gotten rid of the bad stuff. Remember that beautiful futuristic garden? We then met some change makers and thought about how we can create a flourishing future with our actions today. And Una showed us that it's never too late to start. We talked about what it means to talk climate and how making your care for the climate visible is actually a surprisingly powerful way of shifting norms and setting off a domino of social change. We hope that this left you feeling inspired to take your own action, including talking climate. If you did a call to action from last time, please feel free to share with us on social media using the hashtag, hashtag talk climate to me, or feel free to talk, uh, to contact us. Our contact info is on our website at www.talkclimatetome.ca. So today we're focused on love and empathy. Sometimes I hear all the terrible things happening in the world and it gets me questioning where is the love? Where is the love for our planet and for people and for all the beings in this world? So we're going to start today 
by talking about what it means to live in an overheating world and how climate change threatens what we love and who we love. Then we'll explore how climate change disproportionately harms marginalized and racialized communities. We're gonna get real and talk about just how bad it could get. So part of today's episode is going to get a little heavy. We wanted to give you a heads up and remind you to take care of yourself. In the second half, we're going to focus on what a climate safe future can look like and how each of us can help create that world through our actions. Okay, so let's get into it. Last time we gave you a broad overview of the problem, which comes to the planet has a fever because we're burning fossil fuels. Now we've all heard things like, but it's just a couple degrees warmer. Won't that be nice up here in Canada? Well, we asked some folks who are very invested in the future to explain why overheating, even by a couple degrees, is a huge problem. Why does warming matter? Warming might sound good when you live in Canada, but it's really not. A few degrees warmer might not sound like much, but it really is. Our goal is to keep warming to 1.5 degrees because anything beyond that makes life really, really hard. Under 1.5 degrees is what we want to keep life safe. But the warming has already happened. It's affecting everything. Predictable weather patterns we've been used to for centuries are being disrupted, which means more extreme weather. Tornadoes in Barrie, flooding, my soccer games keep getting flooded out, droughts, and forest fires, making it hard to breathe. In some places, it's getting so hot, the world are mess. Pretty much everything we've thought of as normal has been disrupted by climate change. This isn't the hottest year, it's the coldest year of the rest of your life. At a certain point, we can't stop the warming because of feedback loops. This is when the warming causes more warming, and it just keeps looping and looping and looping. This is called runaway climate change. And you know it's bad, because if your dog ran away, that would not be good. That would be very bad. That's why it's really important that we bring emissions down now. Things are pretty serious, because we've already locked in a lot of warming, and there's not a lot of time to fix it. But there's enough time to create a better future if we get moving right now. So, let's do it. What do you think? Are you up for it? Okay, so climate change is already happening and it's already causing significant hardships. And this weird weather threatens what we love, everything from soccer games uh, getting flooded out to homes being destroyed by tornadoes. You know, that's not something people in Barrie used to have to worry about. But it doesn't affect all people equally. We live in a world of overlapping emergencies and the climate crisis is a threat multiplier, meaning that it makes existing problems worse. We see this at the scale of countries. In many places in the global south, droughts are decimating crops, adding shocks to already stressed food systems. Famine, migration, conflict, these are all cascading impacts of climate disruption. In Madagascar right now, families are facing starvation after four years without rain. A worker with the UN World Food Program said, these people have done nothing to contribute to climate change. They don't burn fossil fuels, and yet they are bearing the brunt of climate change. And unfortunately, we also see the same pattern repeated within our borders here in Canada. In Sarnia, Amjanong First Nation sits in the shadow of Chemical Valley where dozens of refineries turn fossil fuels into plastics, fertilizers, and other chemicals of modern life. But benzene leaks from these refineries have been measured at more than 400 times Health Canada's limits. And many believe this is causing high rates of respiratory illnesses and rare cancers within the community. This means that the people living here are constantly checking their phones for alerts of another leak. And it's not just Omgenon. 25% of the poorest neighborhoods in Canada's urban areas are within one kilometer of a polluting facility. Here's another example. Extreme heat disproportionately affects people of color and those in lower income neighborhoods. One factor is trees. In wealthier neighborhoods, abundant green spaces help keep things cool, while lower income communities bake in a sea of concrete. This has direct and sometimes fatal health impacts as people suffer from heat stroke and other heat related illnesses. And one last thing, 
Climate change impacts are not gender neutral. Already, 80% of those displaced by climate change around the globe are women. And women and children are 14 times more likely to die from extreme weather impacts than men. Also, gender-based violence increases after extreme climate events, including in Alberta after the 2013 floods. These are just a few examples of how race, poverty, and gender intersect to increase one's vulnerability to climate impacts. We asked a couple of women to share how climate is impacting their communities. Dr. Courtney Howard is a planetary health policy consultant and emergency medicine physician in Yellowknife. She works closely with indigenous communities at the intersection of health and climate change. Hi, I'm Dr. Courtney Howard. I'm an emergency physician in Yellow Knives Dene territory. And in 2014, we had a summer of smoke here that resulted in wildfire smoke for two and a half months. When we did a study, we showed doubling of emergency department visits for asthma and rates were higher in Dene people. And we're not sure if that's because houses were less able to keep the smoke out, whether it meant that uh, people were having trouble accessing primary care resources, so they were coming to the emergency department. But it does make us wonder how people in the Indigenous communities in the North will be disproportionately affected by climate change. Yeah, it's a troubling illustration of how the impacts of the wildfires are then exacerbated by poor housing conditions and barriers to accessing healthcare in Indigenous communities. Here's another example. Sara Jarice Cruthers is a PhD student and is the co-founder of the Black, Indigenous and People of Color, or BIPOC, Growing Collective. I think that for a long time there was an assumption that climate change isn't going to affect us in the global north, like it won't happen somewhere here. Um, and in the last couple of years, we've seen a real increase in sort of severe weather events, more tornado warnings than we've ever gotten, really uh, strong flooding, and that is along with drought, low water levels. Um, so we have a lot of extremity in terms of water access. We've had boil water advisories downstream from Peterborough. Um, and I think, the temperature has really, people have started to notice how hot it is getting in the summer and how cold it's getting in the winter. Sara reminds us that already here in Ontario, people are experiencing such a range of impacts from flooding and low water levels to tornado warnings and extreme heat. Okay, so climate change is happening. We're already feeling its impacts. It's deeply unfair and it's going to get worse, especially for communities that are facing other inequities. While extreme weather today gives us a taste of what's to come, I sometimes still find it hard to grasp what this will really mean a few years down the road. Like, will it be a literal dumpster fire? To understand what it will look like as it gets worse in our own communities, we asked one of our favorite climate experts, Dr. Laura Tozer, to give us a lowdown. Laura is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, and she helped design Talk Climate to Me, and she's on Project Neutral Steering Committee. Now, I want to preface this by saying, yeah, it, it's bad. Um, we need to tell you this because it's the truth of what could happen. But again, it's not the end of the story. There's this doomer climate narrative you hear a lot, and it kind of justifies doing nothing because, like, what's the point anyway? But remember, this is what could happen if we don't take action. But like Kim said last week, we can fix it. We've got the solutions. So keep that in mind as Laura walks us through this. Climate change means literally everything will change. Recently, we've seen unprecedented fires in North America. We've seen hurricanes that are stronger and more frequent. This is climate change happening in real time because we've already warmed the planet by one degree. As we continue to warm the world by burning fossil fuels, we know that our weather will continue to get weirder, whether that's more intense heat waves or more extreme flooding or more severe storms. At the rate we're going in 30 or 40 years, Toronto could have 55 days a year above 30 degrees Celsius. When I was growing up here, there were an average of 12 days a year that hot. These changes are so intense, we're breaking our cities. All of our infrastructure was built for the wrong climate now. When it's really hot, asphalt melts and train tracks expand. 
Already we've seen places where car tires have melted into the roads. And when it was 46 degrees Celsius in parts of the US in 2021, doctors in the burn units had to issue a public warning because people were coming into the hospital with burns after they had touched hot asphalt. And flooding too. When 500 year flood events start happening every few years, it blows out bridges and swamps roads. I honestly don't know how to describe the danger we're in without warning you that our future climate could really become some kind of hell on earth. What is hot today becomes hotter tomorrow. Wildfires become more dangerous. Deadly droughts become more widespread. And there's a real danger of a horrible domino effect where something like a drought kills crops in the prairies and then higher food prices hurt people, especially the most vulnerable in our society. If we keep emitting carbon pollution, by the end of the century, civilization itself could be at risk. That might seem a long time off, but children who are already born will be there. What experts are really worried about are catastrophic, world-changing events, like forest diebacks across entire continents and collapsing ice sheets that raise the sea level by meters. We have to do everything we can to avoid runaway climate change that spirals out of control. Now, I know this feels overwhelming, but stay with me here. We can avoid these impacts. Our future is not set in stone. Every single action we take now to prevent warming matters. We can change things as long as we treat climate change like the crisis that it is. Runaway climate change could mean we won't be able to stop it as shellfish literally cook in the ocean as homes slide into rivers, and as millions of people are forced to flee. And if it hasn't become clear, this isn't just about just saving the planet, it's about saving us. Certainly when you focus on this potential outcome and what is at stake, it feels overwhelming, it feels scary, and it's easy to throw up our hands in despair and fear. I have felt those feelings for sure during my climate action journey. When governments go backward with climate policy, when major disasters occur, when you feel like you're taking climate action alone. But as Laura said, and what we really want you to remember is that we still have a window to act. We can save the planet and we can save all that we love. Before we get to that hopeful outlook of the world that we can still create, we just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that for some of us, this might feel really heavy. The scale of loss and suffering, it's a lot. We're trying to share a ton of information with you in a short period of time. And we're so eager to race to sharing some solution, some solutions, and that's coming up in a sec. But frankly, this doesn't really leave a lot of time to honor the grieving and the breathing. So if this is feeling fresh for you, know that for most of us, this is an ongoing process. And when those feelings come, give yourself grace and find ways to take care of yourself. Taking care of yourself is so important when you're a change maker. Now, how you do self-care will be unique to you. For me, it's putting my phone away because climate headlines are really scary. And it's binge watching really bad movies and then going out to nature um, to feel, you know, fully restored. Our friends at Carbon Conversations Toronto have, um, on the other hand, have seen the relief that comes when people come together to talk about these feelings. So take a moment to notice how you're feeling and to think about the practices you draw on to restore you. What's already in your bundle for taking care of yourself? Now, this is an exercise in noticing that, you know, you can sit with these feelings and that you have the tools to be okay. So I'm going to play some music and then I'll see you on the other side. I hope it was useful to reflect and have a moment to think about 
what tools that you have um, to keep yourself, you know, restored as a change maker and to take care of yourself. But, you know, sometimes all you need to actually give yourself is a kid and break. <laughs> oh, those, those little faces. <laughs> and if this ever feels too heavy for you, just know, first of all, that our, you know, pain for the world also connects with, you know, our love for the world. Um, as Joanna Macy says, the other face of our pain for the world is our love for the world, our absolutely inseparable connectedness with all of life. I also want to remind you that there is support um, if this is ever feeling too heavy for you. You can find some resources on our website and we'll pop some in the video description as well. Okay, so we're going to transition to seizing the day. But before we do, let's actually take a second to shake it off, literally shake it off. So I'm going to stay seated, but stand if you'd, you'd like. And we're going to start by shaking our hands so really let your wrist go, then add in the rest of your arms. I know, I know I look ridiculous. So you probably look ridiculous, but let's just go with it. Get your elbows and shoulder joints to relax. If you're standing, hop slightly, shake out your left leg, shake out your right leg, shake out your head. Three, two, one. Whew. So let's switch gears. Yes, it's going to get worse and it could get really bad. And that's the narrative we're used to hearing and it usually ends there. But it doesn't have to be this way. If we remember what we cherish and act out of love and empathy, love for ourselves, our families, our communities, all the beings of the earth. And, and what is awesome is that we do truly have another option. So let's talk about what a climate safe future could look like. At this time, um, I recommend you pause this video and head on over to the Imagine video by that features Shia Bastida. The link is in the video description. She's going to help us imagine a climate safe world. Welcome back from uh, the video feature, the Imagine video featuring Shia Bastida. If you haven't had a moment to watch it, again, I recommend that you do. The link to the video is in our video description. I'd like us all to take a moment and think about either what strikes you about Shia's video or maybe what is still implanted in your mind from the 2050 video from episode one with Jamie. Or perhaps use your wild imagination and think about what strikes you about a climate safe future. You know, for me, I imagine safe walking and biking routes. I imagine fast electric trains and community gardens that keep everyone food secure. And finally, I imagine beautiful native gardens that, pro that promote an abundance of biodiversity. But it's your turn now. What strikes you about a climate safe future? I'm going to play some music and I'll see you on the other side. I hope it was helpful to have a moment to think back on uh, Shia's Imagine video, Jamie's 2050 video, or just using your wild imagination on what a climate safe future could look like and what's, what excites you about it. And honestly, when I think about a climate safe future, what strikes me is how it's really not that different. 
I mean, I might still binge watch Netflix in bed, but my laptop will be powered with clean energy and it'll be a heat pump keeping my home cozy instead of a fossil fuel burning furnace. And then, of course, there's the part that about knowing that we've, you know, staved off even worse effects for people around the world who are already experiencing unimaginable impacts from even less than 1.5 degrees of warming. And that's important. And as she has said, these things are all possible with the technology we already have today. And each solution is a piece of the puzzle in creating a climate safe world. And it's not just that it's this like hopeful, optimistic message. It's also about countering the climate doom narrative because actually we are making progress. We're seeing more of the good stuff, like how 90% of all new energy last year was renewable and that we're slowing the bad stuff, things that lock in further pollution. A recent report found that indigenous led resistance has staved, staved off the equivalent of a quarter of the US and Canada's annual emissions. That's a pollution equivalent to 400 new coal fired power plants. Dallas Goldtooth of the Indigenous Environmental Network reminds us that confronting the climate crisis is inherently confronting the systems of colonization and white supremacy. And the same communities that are disproportionately affected by climate change are the ones leading the way. They're defending the land, the water, and the rights of children and opening up our collective perceptions of what a caring society could look like. And women specifically are stepping up because frankly, this is what we do. We are the caretakers. Do you know where the term tree hugger comes from? I only recently learned that it originated with women in rural India, first in the 1730s, and then beginning again in the 1970s with the Chipko movement, where women literally clung to trees to protect them from logging. It's women who are on the front lines of forest protection, who are going on hunger strikes to demand clean water, organizing to stop pipelines, and Indigenous Black and women of color in particular are and always have been on the front lines of the resistance. We asked two women to share their stories of le leading climate action in their communities. Patricia Wilson works with the Kawartha Land Trust and is the founder of the Diverse Nature Collective. She was frustrated by the lack of diversity in the environmental sector. She would often be the only person of color at conferences. Patricia took that frustration and turned it into action. So being frustrated with this and trying to find uh, a way to kind of address this issue in my community, I founded my own organization called the Diverse Nature Collective, which aims to mobilize and empower BIPOC voices in my community to be a part of the environmental and outdoor world. We aim to host workshops that are led by diverse groups um, for diverse folks to help build skills and share knowledge. And we hope to partner with local conservation groups and environmental groups um, and to act as a conduit for bringing in more diversity and more more diverse voices to these organizations to help um, contribute to greater change in the future. Yes, I love her story. It's so inspiring. I'd now like to introduce you to Dr. Hind al Abadle. She is a professor of chemistry at Wilfrid Laurier University. She's currently leading a research partnership assessing air quality and children's exposure to traffic emissions. Climate action in my community is a still work in progress. For example, I've seen investments in public transit and bike routes, supporting local farmers markets and educating the public on energy efficiency. I've started a pilot project to monitor air quality near schools in Kitchener with university students and local government partners and raised awareness on the urgency to act through media interviews and at community events. With the recent release of the IPCC report that gave us code red for the humanity's role in changing the climate, the time to act is now and I am happy to join your Talk Climate to Me initiative. Thank you. Dr. Ella Abadle is doing important work helping to ensure good air quality, especially for the most vulnerable in our communities. We must listen to communities that are most affected by climate change and uplift their leadership because when you're close to the problem, you're necessarily close to the solutions. This is where I'd like to share again or, 
or expand upon what Project Neutral is doing to encourage diversity and inclusion throughout our course. In developing our course, we reached out to local climate leaders to share their experiences. We had BIPOC experts critique our course to ensure we had a comprehensive course that, uh, from many perspectives. And throughout our videos, we amplified, uh, we amplified BIPOC voices. We are committed to diversity and inclusion, and we continue to take steps to improve. Actually, it's our dream to diversify the facilitators of our course, and that's only one you know, idea we have in our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. All right, so I am so inspired by these leaders, but of course, we can't just rely on, on them. It's up to all of us. We all need to act. This is the decade where we decide our collective future. We are the last generation to have this choice. Forget generation X, Y, Z, we're generation climate. Think of it this way. We have to run a six minute mile every year for 20 years to stop, to stop climate change. We could walk this year, but to catch up, we'd have to run a 5.5 minute mile next year. The slower we get started, the faster we're going to have to change later. And at some point, the human body just can't run a two minute mile. Similarly, our societies just can't change that fast, at least not in a way that takes care of everyone. So we need big, bold climate action now to stop runaway climate change and ensure a climate safe world for all of us. You may now be wondering, okay, what can I do? Well, there are literally tons of options. We need to push governments to pass strong climate policies and push companies to transition to the new green economy. We'll talk more about these systemic changes next week, but today we're going to start within our own lives, using our own carbon footprints as a microcosm of the larger system. You see, across Canada, roughly 45% of greenhouse gas emissions are connected to household choices. It's not that we're burning all those fossil fuels directly. Yeah, when we drive a car or heat our homes with natural gas, those are direct sources of pollution. But there's also all the stuff that happens upstream, like burning fossil fuels to make all the stuff we buy. Or think of the meat we eat. Before it gets to our plates, those cows burp up a lot of methane, a potent greenhouse gas. And it all adds up. And actually, as Canadians, we're polluting way more than our fair share. Indonesia is considered a middle-income country, and we're polluting 6.5 times more than them. One person in Canada produces 14 tons of carbon pollution a year. And for friends in the US and Australia, I'm afraid you're in the same boat too. Our three countries tend to swap places as the three worst. And around the world, the richest 10% of people produce a staggering 50% of emissions. The poorest 50% only contribute 10% to the problem. And in fact, if you earned $50,000 Canadian per year in 2015, that put you in the top 10% globally, even if you don't feel rich. Oxfam estimates that those in the wealthiest 10% need to cut our emissions by 90% to keep warming in check. Us over consumers have got some work to do. Now, maybe you're thinking, but it's not up to individuals. It's about collective actions, action. Governments and big companies, they need to step up. And yes, you're right. If that's what you're thinking, stay tuned for episode three. And it's also true that individual actions can catalyze broader change. Governments act in response to public pressure. For example, let's say you switch from a gasoline car to an EV. That, this not only reduces your emissions, but it shows companies there's real demand for EVs. And it shows your friends and neighbors that this is a totally normal, normal, doable thing. And honestly, like studies have shown that people are more likely to get solar panels when their neighbors have them. So how do you know where to take action? Well, it's important to start by understanding where our own emissions come from. Measuring our carbon footprint shows us, that shows us the climate pollution that we have the most control over and helps us figure out what we can do. All right, you're going to have a chance to look at the climate pollution you generate across five categories, home energy, daily transportation, travel, food, and waste. Before we jump in, I'd like you to just take a second and in your head, rank these five categories from highest climate impact to lowest. 
So on your worksheet or in your head, write those predictions. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. All right, now that you've got your predictions, what's the right answer? Cliffhanger, you get to find out for yourself. I'm going to show you how to use Project Neutral's carbon footprint calculator. And then you can find out your results after this session, after this episode, and compare your results to your predictions. So you're going to start by going to www.projectneutral.org. Just click on the pink Get Started button. Then you'll be taken to the login page. Create an account and you're good to go. From there, it takes about three minutes to get a snapshot of your climate impact. You'll see questions about the size and age of your home, and you'll see other questions about your typical diet, driving habits, and more. Once you hit calculate your results, this is what you'll see. So this is my dashboard here. The middle box 10.7 shows my household carbon footprint. So that's about 11 tons of carbon pollution per year. You can think of that like 11 buses filled with CO2. On the left in yellow, it shows the average for my household size, which is two people. And on the right in blue, that's the footprint for the top 30% of project neutral carbon footprint calculator users of my household size. Think of this number as not where you need to be, but as inspiration of how you can act and the impact you can make. So we're less than average, but we've still got lots of room for improvement. You can also see how your impacts break down across each category. When you get your results, notice how they compare with the predictions you made earlier. In our case, food emissions are the highest, but we can also improve our daily transportation and our waste emissions. Now, this is just an estimate, of course. If you want, you can use Project Neutral's additional deep dive modules to refine your results to make them more precise. One point to make, though, is that this is calibrated for Ontario, where our electricity grid is pretty clean. If you live in a place where they burn coal to create your electricity, for example, your emissions from home energy could be much higher. So that's how it works. Now, sometimes when we do this, people feel a bit hesitant about seeing their impacts. If you happen to be feeling that, well, first of all, it's pretty normal. But we want to emphasize that this isn't about shaming or guilting for a few reasons. The world we live in wasn't designed with climate change in mind. There are some places you may not actually have much choice. You can't take public transit where it doesn't exist. And it's not where you're starting from. The goal is to help you understand your impacts so you can prioritize your actions. Finally, understanding where our own emissions come from then can help us know what kind of change to advocate for. Once you find out where your climate impact is the highest, Project Neutral offers lots of suggestions uh, for actions that you can take and an action journal to log your progress. But, you know, we can't make all the swaps all at once. Um, so as you're thinking about what actions to prioritize, focus on the biggest levers. Don't sweat the small stuff and don't expect perfection from yourself or others. Here's an easy way to remember the big three areas of impact. Fleet, heat, meat, repeat. Let's look at fleet or transportation. Two of the highest impact actions you can take are switch to an electric car or ditch the car altogether um, and avoid flying. For heat, we need to massively increase the energy efficiency of our homes. That means getting you know, better insulation, replacing furnaces with heat pumps, getting off natural gas, make your next stove electric. That helps the climate and improves your indoor air quality. For meat, well, half of all our food emissions come from meat and dairy. So going plant-based is a huge step. And of course, if you see something you can't act on, like if you rent, you probably don't have much sway on building insulation. Well, number one, don't stress. There's always something you can control. And number two, that might be something you want to advocate for, like policies and incentives to encourage landlords to retrofit buildings. All righty then. That's, that's it. So let's have a quick recap of what we learned today. We covered a lot of ground. We started off by diving into why it's a problem that the world is heating even by only a few degrees. We heard the terrible tales of how bad it could really get and how these changes are disproportionately impacting marginalized communities. We took a moment to check in with our feelings and practice taking care of us, ourselves by making space to grieve and breathe. 
Then we look towards the good future and what a climate safe world could look like, including how we already have all the tools we need to create it. We hear stories of people leading the way to that future and that we can all get there if we act now. Finally, we introduce you to Project Neutral's Carbon Footprint Calculator so that you can see the biggest area of, your, of emissions in your own life and what actions you can take to make the most meaningful impact, focusing on the big three, fleet, heat, and meat. And of course, we have some calls to action this episode. We have also made them, uh, put them in the video description. So first, fill your feed with diverse voices. Check out Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who are leading on climate. We have a few of our favorites in the video description, but please share who you are inspired by and use the hashtag TalkClimateMe. Second, measure your carbon footprint and invite someone else to measure theirs, kind of like the ice bucket challenge. If you're on social, sharing your footprint is a great way to make it feel less scary for others to do the same. Finally, try taking one action related to reducing your climate impact for one week and talk to someone about how it went. And if you're sharing online, please do take us uh, at, at TalkClimateMe or using the hashtag TalkClimateMe. I love sharing this time with you today, and I'm so excited for you to head on over to the other episodes. Uh, for episodes three and four, or if you happen to miss episode one, head over to Project Neutral's main YouTube page, and we have a Talk Climate to Me episode playlist ready for you. All right, see you for episode three, and happy talking climate. Bye.